So we have once more the pleasure to have Raphael with us uh, for another great lecture, I'm sure. And uh, just to remember that Raphael is uh, French, but he, he loves so much uh, uh, Brazilian culture, music, is actually he's a musician himself <laughs> and uh, so please rafael the floor is yours <laughs> thank you Stephen. um so a third uh, lesson related to uh, persistent homology at least uh, they are asking you which kind of music you play <laughs> i play <laughs> I play Shorinho e Samba no Cavaquinho e no Bandolim no Go. Ah, well, we have to, when I come back, I want to come to the show. Okay, so please go ahead. Um, so, let me give you a brief recap. I introduced uh, the first lesson uh, initial ideas of uh, algebraic topology and, in particular, uh, topological invariance. We've seen, uh, in particular, homology, right? Uh, simplicial homology, that is a homology of simplicial complexes. And I talked a little bit about uh, singular homology, that is the homology of topological spaces. Uh, and we ended this uh, last lesson with the a problem of homological inference, right? The problem can be stated as follows. Uh, we are doing a scientific experiment and we get a point cloud X, a finite subset of the European space. Is being recorded. And we wish, um, we suppose that there is some uh, underlying shapes and uh, underlying manifold. We wish to estimate the homology groups of this unknown uh, shape, right? In this case, this point cloud is seen as a sample of the circle. And the strategy I uh, explained last time was in two steps. First, you will select a, a thickening, right? So we have a whole uh, family of, of thickenings, XT. And at some point, the thickening has the homotopy type of the circle. It can be deformed, right, uh, onto the circle. So you have the homotopy type of the underlying object, and so you just have to compute its homology groups, and we can do that with the check complex, right? Uh, or a variation of it that we use in practice, the ribs complex. Uh, and I uh, also uh, explained that this selection of the parameter t is, is complicated, and there are some uh, cases where it does not even make sense to statistically uh, ask for this parameter t. And so the solution to this uh, problem in, in the, uh, in, let's say, computational uh, uh, topology is to not try to choose only one value of t, but choose all of these values. And uh, persistence theory will help us to build from all these values an algebraic object that is called the persistence module and uh, that will allow to uh, do homological inference. So there are uh, two foundational results in a persistence theory, the decomposition of persistence modules and the stability, right? So we present both these uh, theorems. And I will close the, the session with a, a few examples of applications of TDA. All right. Uh, so let's start with uh, the decomposition uh, of persistence modules. So the notion we will need uh, is the notion of functionality. I explained last time that homology, so this is uh, an operator that takes as an input a topological space and gives a vector space, right, the homology groups. But it also allows to transform a uh, mass. If I have a continuous maps between topological spaces, I can transform the map in the world, in the linear world. So I obtain an induced linear map uh, between vector spaces. So 
So uh, if uh, here this is written for a singular homology, right? Because I consider topological spaces. Uh, but for today, we will consider uh, simply short complexes, right? This is a structure we use in practice. Uh, and so the theory of homology we use is simply short homology. Simply short homology transforms simply short complexes into uh, vector spaces and also maps. But what is that uh, map between uh, simply short complexes, right? There is a notion of um, simply short map that mimics the idea of continuous map. And the definition is really simple. I have two simply short complexes with uh, sets of vertices VK and VL. A simply short map. So this is a map between the sets of vertices such that the image of a simplex is a simplex, right? If I take a simplex of my first simple short complex, then its image, defined as the set of images of all its vertices, must be included in L, right? So I give an example here. K is uh, this uh, segment. It's written here. L is the triangle, and the map F uh, is this one. Um, so uh, we can verify uh, easily that this map is a simple short map because here uh, I look at the one dimensional simplex, zero one. Its image, this is zero one, and it, it belongs to L, right? Uh, counter example. If K is this triangle and L is this uh, two segments, then the map, the let's say identity map on the vertices is not simply show because the image of one, two will be one, two, but one, two does not belong to the simply show complex L, okay? So this is not a simply show map. Uh, uh, um, another example that will be important for us Let's say I have a point cloud uh, and the check complexes at time s and time t, s lower than t, right? Uh, reminder, the check complex, this is the nerve of the cover uh, given by the balls around each point, by the disks, right? So this will be the check complex uh, just before the three balls intersect and the check complex just after the three balls intersect. So, the triangle here is not filled, and on, on the other side, it is filled. And what uh, map will I use? The inclusion map, the, the identity map between the vertices. Uh, and as long as S is lower than T, the inclusion map will always be a simple short map, right? This is because when we increase the parameter of the thickening, uh, the check complex, you add simplices. So actually, the, the, simple, the, the sequence of simple complexes given by the check complex is non-decreasing. So uh, the condition here is always satisfied. All right. Um, so let's have a look at how uh, uh, we can uh, transform these simple maps uh, in the world of homology. So I remind you that we defined last time the simple homology groups. Uh, from the spaces of chains, the spaces of chains uh, being this uh, free generated group, uh, right, on the simplices, that is, we allow to send simplices. And you can very simply, from this simple short map F, define a linear map between chain complexes, between the spaces of chains, right? Um, and what you get, is, so this sequence of uh, this complex of chains of the first initial complex of the second one. And now I have uh, maps between this F0, F1, F2 induced by this simple map F, right? This complex here will satisfy a very nice property. Uh, that is the, the diagram commutes. When I say diagram commute, it means that it does not matter the order 
of the arrows that, that I follow. For instance, if I compose the boundary here uh, and the map F, it is the same thing as composing the map F and the boundary, right? So this is written here in this lemma, simple to prove. And I can deduce from uh, this fact that this map F will send uh, cycles onto cycles and boundaries onto boundaries. All right. Um, that also means, so this is a purely algebraic uh, uh, statement. If I have a map that sends one space into another, another subspace into another subspace, I can define an induced map on the quotient uh, vector spaces. That is, these maps Fn uh, induce a map between the, the quotient vector spaces. And if you remember uh, last lesson, these quotient vector spaces are exactly the homology groups of our simulation complexes. So, purely algebraically, I was able to define from a simple map a linear map between um, the homology groups. All right. It was just for you to have an idea of all this, how this construction works. So in the end, what I get are the, all the homology groups of K of L and linear maps between these groups. Uh, you can think as these maps are as follow. If you have a chain in K, uh, so a sum of simplices, right? Epsilon being a, a coefficient. Uh, then the image will be uh, the sum with the same coefficients, but then you take the image of the simplex, right? So how is um, that in practice? Let's say first that I have uh, the same simple complexes. K and R are triangles. So H0 will be Z over 2Z, okay? The vector space of dimension one, because I have one connected component. And H1 will be Z over to Z also, because I have one, one hole, right? And in this case, um, I consider the, the map, uh, the map I consider is the inclusion. It's also the identity map. Uh, so this map will induce the identity between the homology groups, right? So the identity between simple complex complexes uh, induces the identity between homology groups. Uh, another less trivial example, K now is a triangle and L is a field triangle. I also consider the inclusion of the first one into the, the other. Uh, so the first homology group here is still Z over 2Z and the second one is zero. I have no H1 uh, cycle in this. And so induced map, is the zero map actually it's the only possible map right between the spaces i have another example here k is still this triangle and l now is the two triangles uh, with a common edge okay so what is the homology group of l h1 uh, it is z over to z or two because I have two cycles, right? I have two holes. Um, these vector spaces, uh, I, I can use all the theory of linear algebra, right? I can choose a basis for the first space and the basis for the second one. If I choose as a basis for the second one, uh, the basis formed by the first triangle and the second triangle, then uh, uh, the inclusion map will induce a linear map whose matrix is like that. Actually, uh, there should not be a, um, a column here. It should, it should be only one column, right? The first cycle is sent to one zero. Because it goes from a space of dimension one to a space of dimension two. All right. I think I have a, a last example. A now is a hexagon, okay, six vertices. 
and uh, L is a triangle. The map I consider F is uh, the identity modulo tree. That is, I send uh, the vertex zero onto zero, uh, one to one, two to two, and I send three to zero, four to one, and five to two. So I roll my hexagon twice around the, the triangle. Uh, these two uh, simplicial complexes admit the same homology group, Z over to Z, right? I have one hole uh, in both spaces. So question for you, what will be the induced uh, map uh, in homology? Do you have any idea? Um, let, me, let me put the chat. I will put the chat close to me. So if you have any question at some point, you just write. All right. Uh, so the answer to the question is uh, that the induced map is zero. It was a hard question, actually. Um, this is because when you follow this this map you roll the the cycle twice right so what you get in the codomain at the end you get two times the the cycle right and two times the cycle is zero because in z over to z two is zero okay this could be understood as a phenomenon called a torsion um but well these kind of things can happen, right? And so, um, as I explained already, um, the category, uh, the, the, the simplicial complexes um, form a category, and the homology is a functor, right? So you transform spaces, you transform maps, and you have this important uh, functurality property that says uh, the following. If you have three spaces and two maps, and you consider the composition, you transform everything. And what you get in the end uh, is that the uh, transformation of the composition is equal to the composition of the transformations. Right? And again, this is a quite quite fast to, to, to prove. All right. So now we can uh, go back to um, persistence. <clears throat> Let me recap uh, what we've done. We have a point cloud, right? And we consider the thickenings of this point cloud. So what we get is um, an increasing collection of subsets of the Euclidean space. Uh, we will convert these subsets into um, simplicial complexes using the check complex, right? We take the nerve of the cover given by the thickenings. And these enclosures, I will give the name to them, right? Instead of just writing the inclusion like that, I will call it uh, I-T1-T2, okay? Because an inclusion is, 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 can be seen as a map. Right. So now I get a sequence of simplicial complexes connected by inclusion maps, and I will transform that in homology. So I obtain what is called the diagram of vector spaces. That is a sequence of uh, vector spaces connected by uh, linear maps. All right. And now in this structure, I can start to talk about persistence. So let's select uh, a time value, T0, and a cycle of the check complex at time T0. OK, so I represented here the whole. I will define uh, the death time of this cycle as the super value of T's 
such that the image of this cycle is non zero. Or it could be also the smallest value such that, that its image is uh, zero. All right. I can also define uh, uh, its birth time as the smallest value such that it admits um, a pre image. Right. And the persistence of this uh, cycle here will be defined as the difference between birth and the time. All right. So this cycle here does not have a large persistence because if you increase a little bit the radius of the balls, it is zero. We have a cycle of higher persistence here. It is the, the big one, right? In order to kill this uh, hole, you have to increase up to something like the radius of the circle, right? And these large uh, persisting cycles, this is what will be interesting for us in a persistent homology. The, 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 the idea being that cycles with large persistence uh, will correspond to um, uh, intrinsic, let's say, uh, uh, interesting relevant features of our data set. They will represent actually homology of the underlying shape, while the short living cycles could be considered as topological noise. All right. This little cycle here, it's really an artifact of the way the points are sampled. And so what we can do to make this idea um, precise uh, is we will create an algebraic structure that is called the persistence module. And this persistence module will mimic the whole construction we, 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 we just did. So a persistence module is defined as a, a collection of vector spaces, okay, a VT, where T uh, is a parameter in the real line. And for each pair of vector space, a linear map, VST, between VS and VT. And I ask two axioms. First, VTT, for any T, uh, must be the identity map. OK. And uh, if I have two maps, uh, VRS and VST, the composition must be equal to VRT. So what is this? This is simply the functorality property right, of uh, homology. And so our main example of persistence modules is what we've built before. You start from a filtration. A filtration, so this is a, a, a non decreasing sequence of simple short complexes, right? So you can think about check complex, ribs complex, but you have, I mean, a lot more uh, uh, different constructions uh, of filtration that I'm going to show you a bit later. And from this filtration, you apply homology, and what you get here is a persistence module, okay? So now we've defined a new algebraic object. The first thing to do is to define the notion of uh, isomorphism, right? To be able to compare persistence modules. And uh, the nice notion of isomorphism between persistence modules is the following. Uh, it will be uh, a family of isomorphisms. So you, you want an isomorphism between each uh, vector space. But this is not enough. You want to ask a commutativity condition also. Uh, you want that for every S and T, the composition of VST and phi T, phi being the isomorphism, uh, is equal to the composition of phi S and WST, right? This uh, implies that you preserve the structure of the persistence modules. All right. So now let's talk about uh, decomposition of persistent modules. Uh, so I will uh, consider two persistence modules here, V and W. 
what I can do is define the sum of two persistence modules, right? So to define a persistence module, I have to define vector spaces and link maps between these spaces. And the sum is simply defined as the vector space at time t will be the sum of the vector spaces at, at time t. And the linear map will be simply the concatenation of the linear maps coming from these persistence modules, right? If I have x, y in this sum, I associate it to uh, the image of x by the linear map of the first module and the image of y by the linear map of the second person module. And now uh, I can talk about decomposability. I say that another persistence module, u, is indecomposable if uh, the following is true. Each time that I write it as a sum, then one of those summons must be zero, right? So in other words, you can decompose non-trivially uh, uh, this persistence module, right? If I can write a persistence module as a sum of two other persistence modules um, that are not trivial, I say that the module is uh, decomposable, right? So this is, this is a very general idea of uh, decomposability. Uh, what we do usually in math uh, after defining what is a decomposition, we talk about the elementary bricks with which we will decompose the objects. And the elementary bricks uh, of persistent uh, theory are the interval uh, modules. So to define them, I choose an interval, okay, uh, of the real line. Um, so it can be closed, open, or semi-open. The interval module associated to this interval is defined as follows. I take the vector spaces um, z over to z, so the, the, the field, right, the vector space of dimension one, if the parameter the t belongs to the interval, or I take zero otherwise. Here, this is my interval. Uh, uh, pink color indicates that I have z over to z, and outside I have uh, zero. And what are the linear maps that I will use? Uh, if my two parameters s and t belongs to the interval, I will take the identity map. And if they do not, uh, I will take the zero map. Okay, so this is a very simple uh, persistence module. And they satisfy a very nice property that the interval modules uh, are indecomposable. Okay. If I have uh, several intervals, I can. Uh, several interval modules, I can sum them, right? Just following the definition I gave before, the, the sum of these two interval modules will be this one. And by increasing the number of intervals, you get more complex uh, persistence modules. And this is how we try to decompose in general uh, persistence modules, right? But first, I'd like to uh, give an important result. Ah, yeah. Now, first, here I define the notion of decomposability. Uh, given a persistence module V, uh, I say that it admits a decomposition into interval modules if uh, you can find a multiset of intervals of R, not T here, should be R, such that your uh, persistence module is equal to the sum of the interval modules associated to these intervals, right? Um, and so the first important result is in this context is actually a consequence of um, general results in the commutative algebra, uh, is that if my persistence module uh, admits the decomposition into interval modules, 
then the decomposition is unique. Okay. Uh, so I can talk about the decomposition into intervals. And this decomposition, I will give it a name. I will call it the persistence barcode of my persistence module. Okay. Um, so as a remark, here I said um, multiset because I can have several times the same interval in a, in a decomposition, right? So this is a set with multiplicity. So let's say I have a, a persistence module uh, and a decomposition into interval. Uh, I call this set persistence barcode, and I can uh, draw it like that. I just stack the bars uh, one on top of each other. There is a, another representation that is also used in practice, uh, the persistence diagram. So instead of representing each bar, what you will plot uh, are the, the points, right? A bar, the interval is uh, of the form AB. You will instead plot the point of coordinates AB. So this will be a more compact uh, visualization of the persistence barcode. Because imagine if you have a lot of bars, it can be quite hard to, to read and, and plot the persistence uh, barcode. But these are equivalent uh, notions. So, um, I explained that if you have a decomposition, then it is unique. But do we have a, a decomposition at first point? And the answer is uh, yes. You need a technical condition that I wrote here. Uh, I will uh, study only here uh, twice finite dimensional persistence modules. <laughs> that is, uh, persistence modules whose vector spaces are all of finite dimension. And then you have this uh, very general result that says that, indeed, a pointwise finite dimensional persistence module can be decomposed into interval modules. Hence, it admits a, a, a barcode. Uh, and actually, there were already a, a, a proof of these statements 10 years earlier. Um, so this is a very nice proof that actually only relies on the um, uh, famous result of uh, decomposition of uh, finitely generated modules over uh, principal ideal uh, domains. This also proof is a, is a bit more uh, complicated, um, but it's more general. Right. Okay, so let me share an illustration. All right, so what I uh, represent here is a point cloud uh, and all its uh, thickenings on the right. You can see the parameter t that uh, increases on the left. And on the right are the persistence uh, barcodes, right? So in red is h0, the connected component, and in uh, green is uh, h1, the, the holes. So how can we uh, read this barcode. Let's start with the first one in red. So in red, each bar uh, indicates a connected component that is born at time zero, right? Because in the in the filtration, we add all the vertices at the beginning. And then when the bar stops, it means that the component uh, died. So let's have a look. Let's say I, I stop here. You can see this bar here. I'm at the death time of the bar. So it means that I have a connected component somewhere that merged to another component, right? Connected component, uh, components die by merging into another ones. 
And for instance, this will uh, maybe correspond to these uh, two points here that just merge together. So one of them uh, dies, but the other one will survive, right? And you can see that you have a lot of uh, high persisting uh, components. Something very nice also that you can read on the barcode is uh, the number of connected components that you have at each point in the, in the filtration. For instance, let's stop here. You can see that I have one, two, three, four uh, uh, intersecting red bars, right? So this means that I must have uh, four connected components in my um, thickening. And if I verify here, I have one, two, three, and four. At some point, I only have one bar left. Uh, and so only one connected component left, right? So let's continue with the H1 uh, barcode. This is the same interpretation. Each time I have a bar, it means that I have a new hole that appeared. So for instance, this one here must correspond to uh, the hole here. And I know that it will be filled. It will die at the end point of the bar. So here, it just have been has been filled, right? I have some very small bars that must correspond to very small holes. Um, let's see, for instance, here I have two bars, and they may correspond to this little cycle here and this little cycle here. What you can see, however, is the presence of one long bar, right? That starts here. And this long bar is actually the cycle represented by the, the underlying circle, right? And this uh, hole persists uh, way more than the others. Right up to this point. Up here it's filled. Uh, actually, this is uh, the um, in general um, uh, way we, we read persistence diagrams. When you have a persistence diagram like that, what you will do first is look at the long bars, because the long bars must uh, Signify, signify something relevant concerning your data sets. Here, I have one long red bar and one long green bar. So my underlying shape must have one connected component and one hole, right? And which is actually the, the, the case here, since I have a, a circle. Do you have any question about that? All right, so let me continue. This says okay. So in conclusion, what can we read on the persistence barcode? First, we can read the homology at each step. If I stop somewhere, I know the exact homology of my thickening. But more importantly, I can see how it evolves, uh, which uh, features persist uh, or not. Uh, <clears throat> and actually, the algorithm uh, for computing um, the persistence barcode is basically the same as the one I presented last time for homology. 
you just build a matrix. You will, uh, the boundary matrix, you will insert the simplices one by one according to when they arrive in the filtration. And you do a ghost reduction of this matrix. And in the, the reduced matrix, you will be able to uh, identify the bars of the, of the barcode. All right. Um, I'd like now to introduce the uh, second foundational result of uh, persistent homology, and this is the stability. Um, so the problem of stability uh, is the following. I still have my point cloud, X, right, that I consider as a sample of uh, M. So here, X is here and M will be um, the circle. I have the persistence, uh, the persistent uh, barcode of the check filtration of my point cloud. How can I relate uh, this persistence barcode to the, uh, let's say, theoretical, uh, the, the, the green truth persistence barcode of the circle? The circle. Uh, it is a subset of the Euclidean space, so I can consider uh, also its thickenings and its uh, persistence module and its persistent barcodes. In the case of the circle, it's very simple because thickenings of the circles are uh, analogous uh, rings, right? So it actually has the same homotopy type all along the filtration up to the radius of the circle, where it becomes uh, a, a big ball, a big disk. So the persistence barcodes, uh, direct, uh, barcodes of the circle are like that. One bar in H0 that lasts until infinity, and one bar in H1 that lasts uh, until one. So how can I compare these two barcodes? To do that, I will define a distance between uh, persistence barcodes, all right? And this distance is called the uh, bottleneck distance. Let's say P and Q are uh, barcodes, okay? So multi-sets of intervals. This is Q on the left, uh, P on the left and Q on the right. I will define first a partial matching. So a partial matching, this will be a subset of the Cartesian product of the barcode, P and Q, such that uh, for every bar of the first barcode, uh, there is at least, uh, at most, one bar of the second barcode that is associated to it. Okay? Two bars are, are associated, are matched, if the tuple, the, the, the pair PQ belongs to the partial matching. And conversely, to each bar of the second barcode, corresponds at most one bar of the first barcode, okay? Um, so with uh, this definition, I I mean, if so not to- Sorry, so you're taking the biggest uh, bar, is the biggest bar or- uh... Uh, At this point, I did not, uh, uh, I mean, you have, you have several, you have several possible matchings, right? So this will be a partial matching. This will be another partial matching. Yeah. Yes. This will be the best one, actually, but I did not explain why ah, already. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but when you have uh, barcodes with a different number of bars, you have some bars that will not be matched, right? And uh, these bars that are not uh, matched, I will consider that they are matched with the midpoint, right? The, mid, the midpoint of a bar uh, is uh, the, this point here. I consider the, the single term and I associate the unmatched bar with the single term. Now I will define the cost of a, of a pair. Let's say uh, P and Q are two bars matched together. The cost of this pair will be um, the infinite norm 
when I see these bars are uh, as points of the plane, that is to say, the maximal uh, this the maximal value between uh, the, the difference between the left external points and the right external points. So you take the one with the minimum cost. Uh, is it the matching, the best matching? Is the yeah, one with yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But at this point, I just define matchings in general. Mm -hmm. I do not talk uh, about minimization of the cost. Um, so this is the the cost of a match uh, pair. Mm -hmm. If a bar is not matched, mm -hmm. it is matched with its midpoint. And if you take the midpoint here for Q, you will see that the this quantity is equal to the, the, the half length of the bar, right? And then the cost of the matching will be the supremum of the costs of all the bars, right? And now, uh, as uh, Stefanella said, the uh, what, what I'm interested in too is the matching that produces the minimal costs, right? And this ha ha has a name, and this is the bottleneck distance, right? Between the barcodes P and Q. Uh, and in this case, this will be this matching. So basically, what you want to match together are the, the most similar bar, and right? The and uh, yes, because I remember that there is this uh, algorithm that calculate this. Uh, we were using as a black box so far. <laughs> so what, uh, eventually, these two barcodes have a different number of components. So what do you do with the remaining points? So you match these two bars. But yeah. How do you compute the distance, this extra yeah. bar? How so what is the cost of this uh, partial matching? Mm -hmm. You will have to look at the cost of all the bars. So the cost of this bar, or I must say this pair, this will be simply a difference between the external points. Mm -hmm. But you have also uh, to consider the costs of these little bars that, that are not matched. And so you consider uh, as a cost their half length. The half length of yeah, which the, one? The big ones or the small ones? Or the small one. At the small ones. Yeah, yeah. For each. Um, so you first, uh, you first, you you match the optimal bar, and the yeah. remaining one you take half length. Is it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. And the thing is, uh, the, the 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 cost of the matching is the supremum of all the costs of the of the bars. So if these bars are very small, uh, which is the case here they will not count in the cost of the matching in the end because the, um, the most important cost will be the two long bars, right? Yeah. So you can show that this is a, uh, this is a distance. This is the distance between persistence barcodes. And we can uh, deduce a distance between persistence modules, right? If I have two persistence modules, U and V, I take their persistence barcodes, I compute the bottleneck distance. So now I have a distance between persistence modules, all right? So um, an example here. I took uh, the barcodes P only one interval AB and Q is only one interval A prime B prime. Okay. Actually, you have two possible configurations. Either P and Q intersect, do not intersect, either they intersect. Um, so, what are the matching that exists uh, between P and Q? You have the empty matching, it is when you do not match the bars, right? And so in this case, uh, the cost uh, of the bars will be their half length. So B minus A over two and B prime minus A prime over two. So the cost of the empty matching is this one. And you have the second matching is when you match the two bars together. And so the cost will be this one by definition, right? The bottleneck distance between P and Q will be the minimum between this uh, two costs, right? 
if I consider the interval modules B, uh, AB and A prime B prime, then their bottleneck distance is this one by, by definition, right? All right, so I have now uh, defined a uh, distance between barcodes. I could already state uh, a stability result, but I prefer to go through uh, a last definition that uh, allows to make the theory uh, works uh, very well. And uh, this uh, last uh, notion is that of interleaving distance. Um, so you've seen this uh, bottleneck distance. It is a distance defined at the level of uh, the barcodes, not at the level of persistence modules. The interleaving distance is a distance at the level of persistence modules. Um, so to define um, this distance, I first define an epsilon morphism between two persistence modules, V and W. And this will be a family of uh, linear maps, phi t, now that go from vt to uh, w t plus epsilon. So I undergo some kind of delay in my uh, morphism, right? And uh, these diagrams must commute, right? That is, this composition here must be equal to this composition. So this is a relaxed version of a morphism. And now an interleaving between this uh, persistence module, an epsilon interleaving, will be a pair of epsilon morphisms, one from V to W and another one from W to V, such that these uh, two, these diagrams commute for every T, right? Uh, what does that mean? If I apply my first epsilon morphism and then my second epsilon morphism, what happens is I, I go from Vt to Vt plus 2 epsilon, and this must be equal to the linear map of the persistence module V, right? And same in the other uh, direction. Uh, so that's the definition of an epsilon interleaving. And I can now define the interleaving distance between two persistence modules as the smallest epsilon such that my persistence modules are epsilon interleaved. Okay. And so as you can see, this is an uh, absolutely algebraic uh, definition. I did not talk about uh, persistence barcodes here. So let me take an example. I will consider the interval modules AB and A prime B prime. Okay. Uh, if you play around with this uh, definition, uh, you will end up with um, um, this result. Uh, I won't enter into, into the details. Um, the interleaving distance between these two um, persistence modules is equal to this minimum. And uh, if you remember, this is actually the same, this is also the bottom distance between these uh, persistence modules, right? Uh, and actually, this is a theorem, the, the isometry theorem that given two persistence modules, U and V, the interleaving distance is equal to the bottleneck distance, right? Um, so this distance at the level of uh, barcodes that is very easy to interpret is equal to this very algebraic definition uh, at the level of, uh, at the linear level. And so the, the result naturally splits into two results, a stability result, the result that is called stability, and there's one 
one that is cover stability. Actually, one of these results is hard to prove, and the other one is simple. The easy uh, statement is the converse uh, stability. If you start from um, the bottleneck distance, if you start from a matching between the bars, you can easily deduce uh, an interleaving. All right. In the other direction, it's more complicated. So the first proof of this fact uh, uses uh, the interpolation lemma and other. Uh, even more algebraic proofs arrived uh, later. All right. So now I can put that in context and explain to you why this result uh, is so important. Uh, so let's take two uh, subsets of the Euclidean space. X and Y, you can think of X as our point cloud and Y as the circle. Okay. And I will uh, define the Hausdorff distance, right, between X and Y uh, as epsilon. Uh, so, uh, uh, alternative definition for the Hausdorff distance is that um, X is included in the epsilon thickening of Y. And y is included in the epsilon thickening of uh, x. And you can actually deduce um, that for every t, you also have these inclusions. The t thickening of x is included in the t plus epsilon thickening of y, and conversely. OK? So what can I do now? I first put my sequence of thickening of x uh, on the top. At the bottom uh, of y, and I have these inclusion maps, right? I have the delay of epsilon uh, for x to be included in y, and conversely. And I will transform everything uh, in homology. I know. First, I will take the check complexes. Uh, I take the nerve of the covers, and I obtain the same diagram a sequence of check complexes of X, a sequence of check complexes of Y, and inclusion maps, right? I take this diagram and I apply homology, simply show homology. So what I get now, you recognize the persistence module of the check complex of X here, and the persistence module of the check complex of Y. And what are these uh, linear maps? Actually, these linear maps satisfy the definition of an epsilon interleaving. So what I obtain very directly from the definitions is an epsilon interleaving between the persistence modules built from X and Y. So I deduce that the persistence modules are epsilon interleaved. The, the interleaving distance is lower than epsilon. I use the isometry theorem, and I get that the bottleneck distance is lower than epsilon, right? And this is the stability theorem that has been proven already um, in 2005. Uh, if I have two subsets of the given space at distance, uh, yeah, let's say two subsets, I build the corresponding persistence modules. In the case where they are uh, decomposable, I know that the bottleneck distance is lower than the Hausdorff distance, right? So what does that mean in practice? It means that I can trust the persistence barcodes of my data, right? If I suppose that my point cloud is close to the underlying shape, I know that the persistent barcode are close to each other, right? This closeness being uh, quantified via the Hausdorff distance for the sets and the bottleneck distance for the uh, persistence barcodes. And my whole presentation uh, relied on the auxiliary notion of interleaving distance, right? Which is now a distance between 
uh, persistence modules. Do you have time to give a few examples, Stefanella? Yes, I think we have still uh, five, ten minutes, five, ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Hmm. All right, so uh, let me give you uh, a few applications of uh, these ideas on the concrete uh, data. And the first example is the, uh, the cyclooctane configuration space that I talked about uh, the first uh, lesson. Remember, um, the cyclooctane molecule has 24 atoms, right? And admits different conformations in the space. And what you do, you transform the molecule into a point uh, by gathering the Euclidean coordinates of all its uh, atoms. Right, so you get the points in R72. This point cloud will simply uh, compute its percent homology, right? Uh, the percent homology of its check complex. Um, and you will obtain these barcodes. On these barcodes, what you observe are uh, one long bar in H0, one long bar in H1, and two long bars in H2. And this actually corresponds uh, to the homology of this quite uh, non obvious space that is the union of a sphere and a, and a climb bottom. Uh, and then you can use this information to actually study further the shape and observe uh, this geometry. Uh, I also talked about this experiment of uh, natural images. You take a lot of images and you extract three by three uh, patches, subsets of images. With a lot of images, you get a lot of points in R9, right? And you apply persistent homology. And what you get are these barcodes, where you can read uh, one long bar in H0, Two long bars in H1 and one long bar in H2, right? So we deduce the homology groups of dimension one, two, and one. So this can be, I mean, a lot of spaces admit these homology groups. You have the torus. In this case, this is the, the climb bottom, right? Uh, these examples was the, the rats, um, the, grid, the grid cells. Uh, of the um, brains of rats. And you define a notion of distance between neurons, between grid cells, uh, and you uh, compute the persistent homology of this uh, metric space. And you get uh, persistence barcodes like that. So you are, you are the same, you see the same homology as before. One bar, two bars, and one bar, right? And uh, so it, this indicates the homology of a torus, and then uh, you can study further and really observe a torus. So, right, these were uh, very um, basic, uh, uh, direct applications of the theory. You compute the persistence barcode and you interpret it, and you hope to uh, uh, observe the homology of a known space. And then we can verify that it's actually the space that is underlying the data. Or, or you can do something else. If, in, if it's not known, you can compare with some other parameter that might have identified similar structure. So you might induce some other information. You compare different kind of barcodes from you know the, your phenomena and supposedly some uh, some of the parameter that might have a strong impact in your phenomena they are shaping your phenomena so uh, you yeah. might compare <laughs> yeah right right the this interpretation is very the um, initial idea that you take the barcode and you hope to, to read the homology of the underlying space actually with persistence barcodes you can there are a lot of tools that can be used in, in different manners, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying it, it's not just uh, recovering known shapes. And, uh, it's it's yeah, very rich. Yeah. It's very rich. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to give an example of this, actually. Uh, this uh, uh, cosmic web uh, uh, experiment. So person homology is also multi-scale, right? The parameter increases. And you see, uh, you can observe uh, different topologies. Remember that it's not clear what the dimension of the cosmic web is, or what they mean, uh, what uh, uh, scale we should use. It can be a bunch of stars, or also strings of stars, or it can be understood as clusters, right? What is the persistent homology of the cosmic web? And you can see this experiment here, right? So this is the persistence uh, diagram, but it's put uh, with a rotation. And you can see something very interesting. It seems like there are three uh, behaviors, three patterns, and these three patterns corresponding to the three uh, potential scales we can use to uh, study the cosmic web, right? What are the scale here? So, with how do you use the first to identify these scales? And uh, so, you this is a simulated data. You simulate a uh, position of stars. You do the check complex, mm -hmm. and then uh, on the x-axis, this is the birth time mm -hmm. of the topological features of the cycles. And y axis is the, um, the, the, the persistence. Mm -hmm. Everything in logarithmic uh, scale. Mm -hmm. But how do you identify exact the, the dominant time? You look at the peak, is it? You look at. Um, yeah, so uh, this will yeah. be like uh, at, at this point. Mm -hmm. You have a, a value where mm -hmm. this is a density diagram, right? You have a lot of uh, H1 features uh, mm -hmm. at, at this point, mm -hmm. and then this decreases. Mm -hmm. And again, for some value, you observe a lot of uh, H1 features again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this will correspond to these um, mm -hmm. in the three diagrams. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I will pass on this. Uh, oh yeah, this um, person homology. It's uh, you cannot. It's not only usable on point clouds. You can use it on a lot of other uh, structures. Here, I give an example on uh, of image analysis. So this is a, a collaboration with Anton Francois uh, that just presented this PhD a few months ago. Uh, and he works on a uh, brain tumor. Uh, so glioblastoma, the brain tumor, that's a very important disease to study. And um, what you want to do is given an MRI of the brain uh, to identify where is the, the tumor in the brain. And actually the, this whole problem that is called segmentation. You want to have uh, even more information we would like to uh, label the tumor in various components. You have the whole, the surrounding uh, tumor and the edema. Uh, so what you can do is use persistent homology now for uh, images. What happens is that the tumor, so it's not, you cannot see it here, but um, on uh, MRI, the tumor will, be very, um, will correspond to high to luminous pixels pixel with a uh, high intensity. And so I can find the filtration of my space where I will add the high uh, intensity pixels first and then the low in intensity pixels. And what happens is that the tumor uh, is surrounding by this, this high intensity uh, part. And so if I add first these pixels, I will observe a sphere so this is the persistence diagram of my MRI, and this is actually uh, H2. Uh, and you can see a sphere. If I extract this sphere, I get the surroundings of my tumor, and then I can 
uh, get the other parts with what is inside and what is uh, outside. And so in this context, we use another algorithm uh, that is called uh, cubic persistent homology. So you are peeling, you're peeling the tumor. <laughs> Yeah, yeah like an onion yeah. like an onion yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly uh, very nice very nice you should actually talk to the neuroscience uh, that are working with images of fatima martel they are trying to characterize the activation mm -hmm. so it's not tumor it's activation or, or the brains when people are under stress so mm. maybe uh, so some parts are more like, intense so in this sense uh, you know uh it will be <laughs> it could be related to your yeah 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 so yeah so that would be very nice if uh you can characterize if the same region or you know yeah. how it might vary mm -hmm. cool very nice. let's talk after that a uh, very quick uh, I will just talk about uh, machine learning. So you can uh, uh, introduce persistence homology into machine learning pipelines. You can define kernels, right, uh, between uh, barcodes. What is more complicated is that barcodes are not uh, embeddable in the Euclidean space. The barcodes are not vectors, right, because the number of bars does not have a limit. But you can manage to uh, design kernels for uh, uh, barcodes, and you get uh, interesting studies. You can also uh, put uh, introduced uh, pathology in, in, in neural networks architectures. Um, so you have your uh, usual neural network, and you will add this what they call topological uh, layer, right? That will add information. Um, so H zero percent homology, uh, right? You follow the evolution of the connected components, and you see when they merge together, right? And you can extract actually a more sophisticated structure from the H zero. That is a dendrogram where you can visualize exactly how the components merge together. And this allows uh, to do hierarchical clustering, right? It, it looks like a sort of phylogenetic. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the last example. Uh, you can design a lot of very interesting algorithms with personal homology. I'm using that can kind of take into account the topology of your data, right? And so, for instance, uh, this um, persistence-based clustering Riemannian manifolds uh, is an algorithm that allows to get this as open cloud. It's a lot of uh, noisy points in the space and uh, four circles, right? Uh, so the result of a classical clustering algorithm will give that. And with this persistence-based algorithm, they are able to uh, extract the actual uh, four different circles. Yeah, you can also, uh, so I said person homology on point clouds, person homology on images, you can do person homology on time series how can you do that? If you have a time series, you can convert it into a point cloud with this, the famous technique of time delay embedding, right? A time series, so this is a sequence of values. And you will consider the points. You choose a dimension, N, and you will look at the uh, vectors of N consecutive values, right? And so this gives you uh, a point cloud. And you have theoretical results like uh, Tychonus embedding that states that you can read actually uh, uh, um, properties of your time series in the topology of the time delay embedding. So, what you do is you have the time series, you embed them, and you compute the person homology of the point cloud. And uh, uh, this can give you very interesting information about the time series. Uh, yeah, I think I will I will stop here. Let me just conclude. 
Um, what you can remember from the whole, whole construction is that person homology, uh, right, offers a solution to the problem of uh, homological inference and yields a multi scale uh, and stable estimation of the, the homology of the data sets. And uh, yeah, this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's uh, let's thank uh, Raphael for <laughs> really a lot of information. It, it was amazing how you put together very hard, uh, hardcore uh, uh, algebraic topology and data <laughs> application. So thank you very much again. Thank you. And uh, question, question. Thank you, thank you, yes. Do you have any question? They're just thinking. <laughs> so just to remind you once more that uh, Raphael gave, uh, uh, I will put it again, gave, uh, I'm not sure I can copy. I'm not so good. At, uh, can you put again this reference here? Uh, I'm not so good in copying. The, yeah, the for the people. Of, uh, yeah, for the people that enter later. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here I suggest this reference about TDA. So. In, in addition to his wonderful notes. <laughs> uh, okay, so I just remind you that next uh, Thursday is the last lecture, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and maybe who can, should have some computer nearby. Is it true or not? Yes? Yeah, yeah. so this will be a um, programming session. We will uh, study to get together two examples. Uh, this will be on Python, uh, Jupyter, on a Jupyter notebook. So Kama, Daniel, Andre, just <laughs> you have to have your computer with you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so I will write, please download. And Daniel the, as well. The library, the library goodish. So what do you good on your notebook? Okay. You can and, just pip, pip install goodie. And so. and I can use it on um, the Macintosh on my Apple. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You use Python. You use uh, Jupyter. Uh, use uh, 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 Colab. Colab. Is it possible? I, I might have Jupyter. They stole it to me. I haven't no. used. <laughs> That's fine. If you have, you have Python, <laughs> yeah. just install the library. The that someone get, went through a lot of trouble to install Jupyter on my. <laughs> Okay. I should be able to use it. Okay, so thank you very much. So thank you. next uh, Thursday. Yeah. Thank you. Ciao. Bye bye. Thanks. Ciao, ciao.